back on the Zero Hour. I am, as always, your humble servant and host, Richard R.J. Escal. Now, this is the point where I remind you all that we're sort of on a roughly two to four day lag between the time we record this and the time you hear this. So I suspect the, the drama in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, over Build Back Better will not have been resolved by this point, but there may have been some profound developments. Still, the uh, force at the heart of the, the paralysis, the, 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 the chazurai, whatever you call it, uh, it will remain unchanged. And here to talk about that with us now is my good friend uh, and yours, John Nichols. John is, of course, uh, the author of a number of fine books, including People Get Ready, at, which is a reflection on our possible future and a borrowing from the great Curtis Mayfield for the title. He is also the, the Washington correspondent for The Nation, as you know, and he's been following this story uh, closely and writing about it clearly, so who better to discuss it with than John Nichols. So first of all, John, thanks for coming back on the program. Richard, it's always a pleasure to be with you. And uh, and actually, yeah, I think you're really, uh, yeah, I don't think you have to worry about things getting sorted out well in Washington. There's a pretty good chance they'll go awry. Yeah, I think you're probably right about that. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're uh, recording on uh, Thursday now, Speaker Pelosi, who I've been very impressed with, honestly, during this most of this process for standing her ground. Uh, as most of our listeners know, the issue is, does the quote-unquote bipartisan infrastructure bill get passed separately or as progressives demanded and Speaker Pelosi and the Senator, Senate side uh, Democrats agreed uh, must be passed in tandem with the, the bigger $3.5 trillion Build Back Better bill. Now she's kind of deep well, depending on how strongly you want to put it, uh, shifting her stance or walking back that position. And as we speak, has talked about bringing it to a vote on the floor. Progressives are saying they will not vote for it. They're standing their ground. Also impressive. Um, so, but it seems that all the trouble focuses on uh, two senators. You wrote about them recently. That is to say... Uh, Senator Kristen, two Democrats, Senator Kristen Sinema of Arizona, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. This is this is a bill 97 percent of the party appears to want. And yet, according to polling, and yet these two senators are holdouts as we speak, making it impossible for this bill to go forward. So uh, we know why that is. The Democrats only have 50 votes in the Senate. Um, so we know why they have the power. Uh, I guess the question a lot of people are asking and a lot of people are answering in, in their own ways is, why are they doing this? Ooh, do you have a particular uh, thought on that you want to uh, open with after my long intro here? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll give you a quick answer. I think uh, that uh, Mansion and Cinema are um, the worst of American politics. They're They're or political figures who are uh, at once uh, obsessed with their own uh, personalities, with their own power, not people operating on uh, any set of principles, but rather on uh, a premise that as long as they're the center of gravity, as long as they're in a position of power, uh, then everything else in the universe is aligned. And so they... Both are people who like the spotlight, um, who like to be seen as as leveraging things and making things happen. And 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 I put the ego part ahead of the next thing I'm going to say, because I think that's important. I think that's what the the entry drug, if you will, uh, to the, the next problem here, because politicians who are obsessed with being the center of, of gravity, being the center of action, being the deciders, if you will. Uh, being the quote unquote mavericks, uh, which isn't maverick at all. It's just a, it's a BS term made up by media uh, to uh, talk about people who just do whatever's best for them. Um, uh, 
those politicians have to find a way to secure themselves. And they do it uh, by first identifying as, quote unquote, centrists, right? As if they're somehow between, you know, two camps and they are, right. you know, logical, going to sort everything out. They're going to be the parental uh, figures, the adults in the room. And um, so media likes that. Media is very generous to the idea of a so-called centrist. Um, and then in service of that concept, they start taking money from uh, the most powerful, uh, ugliest, most destructive interests in our politics. And if you take a look at uh, who gives money to Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, and to the so-called centrists in the House of Representatives, you're going to find it's just a slurry of the worst special interest money, uh, uh, you know, big pharma, uh, Wall Street, financial services, kind of everybody who wants to get, you know, a, a dumbed down, weakened federal government that allows them not to be regulated, not to pay taxes, not to serve the common interest. In fact, it is so bad that while we talk a lot about cinema and mansion, we should always keep conscious of the Democrats in the House that have uh, sought to hold things up. And it frankly messed things up, made it harder for Pelosi and for the progressives uh, to you know, send a clear signal from the House. Those people are taking money. I mean, one of them, uh, Henry Quayler from out of Texas, he's taking money from the Koch brothers. I mean, I mean, literally, like I, I, we 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 have Democrats who are uh, stalling out a Democratic president's agenda, stalling out uh, an agenda that is favored by the overwhelming majority of Democratic senators, the overwhelming majority of Democratic House members, and they're taking money from the Koch brothers. They're taking money from Scott Walker's benefactors. So that's, I mean, it's a long answer to your long question. Uh, but I think it, it gets to the heart of the matter. No, I think it's really insightful answer, John. And there, uh, you know, a couple of things I wanted to pursue about it. One is, and by the way, you know, someone like Henry Cuellar is a fascinating example because he's, uh, if I recall correctly, he's in a very safe Democratic seat. He doesn't really need that money, oh. right? And what you, a bunch right? of these ones so are. What, yeah. Yeah. And so what you're describing, see, what you didn't do, which I, I think is very interesting, is you didn't paint a kind of two dimensional portrait of people like uh, like cinema and mansion as just like, you know, uh, licking their chops, rubbing their hands, saying, I can't wait to be corrupted by those, you know, by the filthy lucre they're going to give me. Although, in fact, you morally, that is in effect. Uh, what they're doing. What you described, I think, is more uh, fleshed out and more subtle and therefore, I think, more important to understand, right? Because uh, you can make cartoon villains out of anybody, and that, but you can't counter them, or if you're in the Senate today uh, or House, negotiate with them by doing that. But more importantly for people like you and me and our readers and viewers and so on, uh, who really want to understand what you're describing is a, a mindset uh, and a kind of whole social system that reinforces it, whether it's reporters who praise quote unquote mavericks, whether it's the very term centrist, which is misleading, of course, because the position that they're taking is far to the right of the general public on drug pricing, for example, far to the right of most Republican voters, if I recall my polling correctly as well as most Democrat, uh, Democratic voters, certainly. So, and so therefore it's, uh, it's a, a complicated uh, thing to understand, but it's basically what we're dealing with is a kind of personality and human nature issue that draws a certain kind of person into politics and a system, including media and donors, that reward them. So we have to be smart, savvy, anthropological, whatever you want to say, to uh, to deal with them, and then ultimately, uh, you know, God willing, to get rid of them. But uh, I don't know. Thoughts? Am I just yeah. wandering here? Or no, you know? not not wandering. I think you're being very generous to me, uh, and and so I'm glad to listen to that for as long as you want to say nice things. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, I think this is, this is sort of the heart of what's wrong in our politics. 
And, um, you know, I've just been busy watching the German elections and uh, elections in Iceland, places around the world. And, and generally, uh, even as, as much as, as power systems, political systems in other countries see compromise, they see concession, they see disappointment. I mean, it's not like any place is perfect. Um, you have political parties that actually stand for a basic set of premises, right? right. I mean, right. it's like you have a party on the left, uh, not far enough left now in many of the European countries, but still a social democratic party. Then you have a party on the right, um, not far as right as our Democratic Party, but and we call them Christian Democrats or something like that. And so you got, but you have a competition and you kind of know what you're voting for, right? In the United States, we have historically had these sort of grab bag parties where you can have a, a Marxist and a Southern segregationist in the same political party, which certainly happened during the Roosevelt era, the most successful period for the Democratic Party. Um, it was such a big coalition that you literally had, you know, anti-racists and racists, uh, you know, corporatists and anti-corporate, you know, all kind of in there. And it was and, and it became Roosevelt's job to try and sort that out as best he could, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. The Republican Party was actually very similar, you know, through the Eisenhower era, but really well into Reagan's era. You had, you know, pro-choice, pro-gay rights Republicans right. and you know, and actually Republicans who would side with uh, Democrats on a lot of, you know, worker rights issues, even people like old Jake Javits and stuff Jake like Javits, that. Jake Javits, John Lindsay. Uh, the list um, is long, right? Yeah. yeah and, sure. and so we, we have imagined in the last 20 years since Bush that our two political parties have now become clearly divided, right? You know, the Democratic Party, more of a party of the left, the Republican Party, more of a party of the right, and fewer and fewer of the outliers. But that's not really an accurate uh, assessment of, of right. what's occurred. Um, the Republican Party has, you know, become more corporate than it ever was, right? But also more extreme on the right because corporate, you know, a corporate agenda has very little appeal to the great mass of American people. So you've got to kind of layer on some sort of uh, extremism in the case of the Republicans, racism, xenophobia, mild forms of fascism. Um, and so that's their, their gig over there. For the Democrats, it's an interesting thing. The Democrats have not evolved into a progressive party. They, they've had some, right. some progress in some areas, and I'm not dismissing the power of Bernie Sanders' candidacy and the influence that it had, and even Biden's movement on some such things. But still, the reality is that the Democratic Party at this point is, we're not the Republicans, Right. That's sort of the grab bag there. It's not, we're not as bad as those guys. And that has been, you know, a, a kind of organizing premise of the party for a long time. What has happened, however, is that has allowed for the Democratic Party to take in a, a very large corporate wing that simply says, you know, um, yeah, well, we may not really go along with the party on labor rights. We may not really go along with the party on fair trade. We may not really go along with the party on, uh, even in the case of Quayler, uh, uh, abortion rights, uh, um, you know, and a host of it, but, but we're Democrats, you know, and, and we're not as bad as Republicans. And so then there you go. You're, that's that. Well, now it's coming to a head because the Democrats have a very narrow majority in the Senate, no real majority at all, and a very, very narrow, narrow majority in the House. And in this circumstance, um, they a handful of people who are the most sold out, the most you know, uh, kind of driven by yes, this combination of their own ego, this notion of being a quote unquote maverick, but also by the money, by the big pharma money, by you know all the other influences, they can call the shots, right? right. And so you don't have the situation that you have in other countries where when a party comes to power, you know what you're going to get. In this case, Democrats have the House, the Senate, and the presidency, and yet um, they are in, I think, very uh, real danger right, right now of not delivering on baseline promises of the Democratic platform, right? Baseline promises, you know, expand Medicare, uh, family and medical leave, uh, you know, a, a reasonable expansion of caregiving, lowering 
drug prices. I mean, that's that's like the simplest thing in the world, right? Making college more affordable, saving the planet from, you know, like literally burning to a crisp. Um, these things aren't hard. These are not challenging. And yet there is a very real chance you're not going to get those. And that's because you of know, these bad players. And, you know, I, I, I have to tell you, John, I look at, um, I look at this struggle with a kind of deep ambiguity because you know me, I mean, I consider the Biden plan far less than what we need, uh, to save the planet, to reduce inequality, to make sure nobody dies for lack of health care, on and on and on. I consider this a highly moderated, uh, bill. And so I definitely think it should be a slam dunk. And I've thought this, here, this is a thought I've thought before, and you reminded me of it because I haven't thought about it for a while. In many ways, the Democratic Party looks like a coalition party. It, it, you know, if you look at parliamentary democracies where uh, social Democrats get, uh, you know, 45% of the seats to get over the top, they they have to do a deal with a party that has six seats that's to their right, and all of a sudden the six seats have a veto over the four. You know, that's what the – the Republicans are not a coalition party. I think they're unified around a far-right ideology at this point. You have interesting exceptions. Jim Justice, governor of West Virginia, Republican, uh, became a Democrat to run for governor, then switched back to Republican after he was elected. But, but by and large, you see us kind of – coherence on the re Republican side, which is why they're so effective at getting their nefarious agenda passed when they're in power and getting judges in place and so on. You, you see Democrats kind of fractious. And I wonder to what extent those of us who are activists, writers, voters, you know, whatever, citizens, uh, maybe ought to take a second look at how we do this, because I think way too often, and I'm, I'm like a lot of other people in this, is like, well, at least we'll get a Democratic majority. So a uh, Kristen Sinema may be odious, you know, in a multiplicity of ways, but but uh, she won't be voting for Mitch McConnell as majority leader and, you know, et cetera. I think we do that a lot. You know, Nancy Pelosi in the House loves to refer to the conservative Democrat, quote unquote, my majority makers. You know, there's this idea that this is like, I don't know whether it's a, it's a Faustian bargain Democrats, whether voters or leaders, feel compelled to make, or whether it is, in fact, a marriage of convenience. Like, I think I wrote a piece in 2010, if Joe Lieberman didn't exist, they'd have to invent him, you know, to, yeah. uh, you know, I wonder to what extent if cinema uh, saw the light on $3.5 trillion, another, you know, Mark Warner or somebody else would start to express reservations. So sometimes I think there's some negotiated good cop, bad cop here. I, maybe that's my cynicism, but whatever it is, uh, I feel like all of us from, you know, influential democratic politicians to writers like us to, you know, voters like us should be taking a good hard look at how we imagine or, you know, conceptualize all of this. Uh, what do you think? You're right. I mean, look, um, two things I'll put in play here. Uh, number one, uh, should we be talking about systemic change that would give us a, a clearer system and kind of a more honest politics? Yeah, absolutely. There's no question. And I think there's a lot of arguments for a parliamentary system. Uh, you know, I, on a whole bunch of levels, I'm very, very comfortable advancing that argument. Um, just as I'm comfortable advancing arguments for changing how the courts operate, you know, getting rid of the electoral college. I'm, I, I am, uh, at, at least this I would borrow from the founders. I'm very comfortable with the fact that that the constitution should be changed. That's why they allowed it to be amended. And that we, one of the first changes they made in the constitution was to alter how the presidency and the vice presidency were chosen. That, that amendment was made, you know, at, in the first years when many of the people who actually drafted the constitution were still around, it, they got rid of the plan where the first place finisher was president and the second place finisher was vice president because that was a really dumb plan. Right. They did that, you know, I think right around the time that the vice president shot the former secretary of the Treasury. Um, and and so, you know, look, I, I'm all for that. However, I will also note that we are in you know, a moment now, which I think is such 
such a critical juncture yeah. that if we don't recognize the dangers of the moment we're in and tr- seek to sort it out um, without the, the escape valve of uh, constitutional change and, and real reform, systemic uh, change, which needs to happen, uh, we, we kind of get off track, right? We, we put ourselves in a dangerous place. And so what I would argue is that there is a crass political case to be made for going big, for keeping the 3.5 trillion, right. frankly, for doing more than that, um, and for doing, frankly, what the progressives and Bernie Sanders are proposing. And it isn't just because I like the progressives and Bernie Sanders. I write a little bit of history. I wrote a book, The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party. I had the, as you know from writing, Richard, you know, you get a chance to uh, um, kind of spend a lot of time thinking about stuff and research things and actually find out whether you're right, whether your theories are right. So here's a simple premise, basic premise. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, for all of his flaws, and he had many, went big uh, and and delivered big. And in going big and delivering big, uh, he won every presidential election for four cycles, and he won every midterm election. I mean, they held control of the House and Senate, even though Roosevelt was a very controversial figure. And so what did they do? They they built a, a voting power that allowed them to maintain their position. And then Roosevelt was planning to do that at the end of his life. You know, his last State of the Union address, economic or second left, economic bill of rights, a second bill of rights, right. making housing, health care, everything right. He was good. That was going to be the post-war Democratic Party. He dies. Henry Wallace is pushed off the ticket. So you end up with Harry Truman as president. Truman immediately compromises to the point where the um, Chicago Tribune was saying the New Dealers are out. The Wall Streeters are in. And uh, what happened? 1946, yeah. you lose the House and the Senate, and we get Taft-Hartley, right. blah, blah, blah. So you say, okay, that's a good lesson. We'll never do that again. We'll never, when we have power, compromise. No. You look at, you know, I think, give Johnson his credit. He did pretty well, but then messed up on Vietnam. But then look at the pattern in the last 50 years. Right. Jimmy Carter comes in compromises on all sorts of stuff, doesn't do what Democratic agenda, the unions, Ted Kennedy say he should do, uh, loses a lot of seats in 78, presidency in 80, and the, and the Senate. Um, Democrats claw their way back, and Bill Clinton becomes president with presidency and majority in the House and Senate, something Democrats haven't had in a long time, you know, a good long time. He, what does he do? NAFTA, he works with Republicans, Wall Street, compromises on everything. By 94, he's lost governing power. He's going to have to compromise. The Republicans are in charge. He's going to have to compromise with them the rest of the way through. Barack Obama finally gets back. You know, he's in there president with the House and the Senate. And I think Obama was a better player than Clinton. But Obama pressured by conservative Democrats and centrist Democrats, as well as some centrist Republicans, compromises on his economic stimulus plan coming out of the Great Recession and ends up with a lot of disenchantment, a lot of frustration. We elected Democrats. What do we get? Not enough. You've got decreased turnout and energized Republicans. 2010, Obama loses the House. 2014, loses the Senate. His govern, his power to govern is so diminished that his final Supreme Court nominee doesn't even get a hearing, right? That's, right. that's what losing midterms does to you. And so we, the pattern is so clear, really, for the last 80 years. When Democrats come into power with majorities in the House and Senate and the presidency and they compromise, they end up screwed. They lose their midterms. I I agree with your analysis almost completely, John. The one exception being I'm not sure Obama yielded to pressure from conservative Democrats. Uh, Yeah, I can't read the man's mind, but uh, I I think it's a distinct possibility he kind of got what he wanted out of all this but it, i'll it, never it's know fair to say it's fair to say with each of these presidents that i've cited right you can say that it's a, there's an interplay there we know it's more right. subtle than that but the bottom line is the bottom line is that at that next not way down the line at that next midterm election the punishment is brutal it is the loss Absolutely. of the ability to govern and so what i would say to joe manchin kirsten cinema and all these so-called centrists in the House of Representatives, if you intend to continue to be Democrats, 
right? If that's your, what they're calling right now for advice. Um, yeah, if you intend to continue to be Democrats, then this is what you must understand. Your pressure to compromise, your pressure to sell out the principles on which this, these people were elected and put in power will cause the Democrats to lose the House and the Senate in 2022, and it will cause very likely the loss of the presidency in 2024. And so you are personally at this moment creating a circumstance that has the potential to recreate all of Donald Trump's power in 2016 or 2017, 2018, that, that first stage of Trump's presidency, um, at a point where Trump is arguably, and the Republicans, more authoritarian, more inclined toward what, I mean, is now rather commonly referred to as fascism. Um, and so what you're doing right now, Manchin, cinema, moderate, so-called moderate Repo Democrats, is creating a circumstance where you could well literally be, you know, not just wrecking your party's chances, but potentially creating a situation that would be devastating for the United States of America. It's that bad. Oh, yes, okay. absolutely. And But a couple of thoughts, John Nichols. One is... I will say to his credit that although uh, Joe Biden was not my candidate, uh, he's he, doing fine. Yeah, you know he's he not necessarily it. my ideological soulmate, but I think he absolutely gets that lesson of if you don't do enough in the first two years of your term, you're going to lose the House, you're going to maybe uh, lose the Senate, you're going to lose your ability to get everything done. I, he's been around a long time. I think he gets that. I think he's trying to stop it. As to whether uh, Mansion and Cinema can be persuaded that way, and by the way, the portmanteau people use is, uh, I guess, Manchinema to describe the two of them. Yeah. I prefer yeah. Cinemansion or just Cinchin, but that isn't the one that caught on. But, but I, I actually think they're, you know, I've known a lot of Forbes 100 CEOs. There's a pathology about a lot of them. I think there's a pathology about politicians like Manchin and Cinema too. And I think that appealing to their sense of the higher good to like forswear ego satisfaction, all that is not going to do it. But I think a slightly nuanced take where you say to them, listen, we're going to blame you. Oh, yeah. We're going to blame you when yeah. we lose it. You're going to be excoriated, humiliated, and abused by members of your own party in ways you can't even imagine. Uh, if you dare, Kristen Cinema, do a little video uh, victory dance for the cameras when you killed uh, a fifteen dollar minimum wage, if you play those games again, and I think maybe Biden's too nice a guy for it, I, I don't know who isn't, but somebody has got to say to them, "You will be ashamed to show your faces in public if you stop this, because we'll make sure that happens." Yeah, I look. Um, I, I saw Miami Steve Van Zandt, uh, Bruce Springsteen's uh, longtime uh, compatriot. Uh, doing an interview the other day. And of course, he's a great progressive. And and he, he was basically suggesting that, you know, Democratic Party needs to, uh, you know, Democratic leaders maybe need to watch a few, uh, you know, repeats of the Sopranos, right? They, they need to kind of get a little bit tougher, a little bit edgier, a little bit more prepared to, uh, to throw a punch, not merely at the other side, but at some of their own, if their own are not doing the job. And, um, and you know, I think that, that gets us into the zone, and you're talking about that. But I will also offer one subtlety here, and this goes back to the beginning of our conversation where you said these are ego-driven people, right? These are people that are right. obsessive about you know their own position and their own you know kind of reality. I, I think that's at the heart of the matter that they themselves will be disempowered. You know, Kirsten Cinema is not going to win a Republican primary. It's never going to happen. It, yeah. it, it just isn't, and I don't think Manchin can. It's a little more complex, but I doubt it very much. And so the end result is that ultimately, even though they, they screwed the Democratic Party over, they are wedded to it. And so this notion of a real serious loss of power and a loss of a, you know, kind of any kind of future role that matters in, in the Senate, as well as for these House members, I think that has some resonance with them. And then combined with your threats, you know, promises of, you know, hate, grief and sorrow coming their way. Um, it has it has more potential to have an impact, I think, than some people recognize. And so, yeah, that's bottom line is yeah. that, that these these 
negotiations cry out, cry out for Lyndon Johnson, you know? And, right. you know, I, I mean, this is what's desperately needed because Lyndon Johnson looked into the eyes of people who had been segregationists and said, you know, you're going to back this civil rights bill. You know, um, he looked into the eyes of people who had been, you know, just complete corporatists, total sellouts and said, yep, you're going to back, you know, Medicare and Medicaid. I mean, he would, he, what he did as a president was to bring the hammer down on people who uh, wanted to be sell out awful politicians and made them do the occasional noble thing for the good of the country. Well, we're at that point. And so for Joe Biden, this is it. I mean, uh, he knows how the Senate operates. He knows how Congress operates. This is the point where he, above all others, has to combine that, you know, that appeal to ego, that, that you know, sort of charm, whatever you can do there, with the threat and with the very real threat uh, and everything you can throw at it. And Pelosi has to do the same. Schumer has to do the same. Uh, and so, so the rest, because if they don't, again, this gets beyond the personalities. If they don't, I, I think the, the history is writ so large, the possibility of going small. And, and I understand Manchin, just as we speak, uh, has suggested that his, his outer limit would be like, like a 1.5 trillion, right. so you cut out $2 trillion worth of spending from a plan that it was already 2.5 trillion less than what Sanders had originally proposed. You, you go that route, right? And then you don't deliver in the end because cinema doesn't go along with that or whatever. Um, I think the likelihood of Democrats losing the House and Senate becomes huge. And I do too. Yeah. That's bottom line. Bottom line, scary, yeah. scary bottom line. And then they're already talking about, they're already raising money for a primary challenge against cinema, which seems to me to be utterly appropriate, especially since she, unlike Manchin, ran specifically on things like lowering <laughs> drug prices. So but, she, but in fairness to Manchin, I mean, Manchin's been everything in his life. He's been a New Deal Democrat too along the way. Right. So the truth of the matter is that I'm, you know, I always think primary challenges are, are healthy. Primary challenges are how we got, you know, Ron Dellums and Bella Abzug and Elizabeth Holtzman and AOC. And I mean, you run the list of of great people that came as a result of primary challenges, it's a good thing to have primary challenges. I'm all for that. Um, but unfortunately, you can't primary either of these people until 2024. And right. by 2024, the damage that they could do um, might already have set in place a situation where it is very, very hard for Democrats to, to reverse the, the crisis. Because if yeah, in 2022, we- you, give, you give Republicans the House and the Senate in a bunch of governorships around the country, uh, the likelihood that the 2024 presidential election uh, will be messed with on a hundred different levels, the likelihood that the Supreme Court will be worse than it's ever been, the likelihood that the federal courts will be more corrupted than they have ever been, just exponentially increases. And so uh, I don't mean to, you know, you know me, you and I have known each other for a long time. We've, you know, hung out at techno festivals in, in, uh, <laughs> in Detroit. And so the hidden history, which we should sometimes do, a, right, right. A, but, um, but, you know, you know me, I am not a, you know, uh, you know, somebody who's, I'm not like the sky's falling type, tend to be very optimistic, right. tend to think that things can work out quite well. Uh, still believe that on a lot of levels, but I'm telling you, it, it, this is the this you know this is the moment to break the glass. If they screw this thing up, right. um, I don't think the Democratic Party has a lot of chance to come back from this. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and it's one of the reasons why I call this show the Zero Hour. So, um, listen, uh, there's a lot more I'd love to talk with you about, but we're running out of time. So, as always, man, uh, John Nichols, a Washington correspondent for the nation and author of many great books, all of which you should buy. Uh, thanks for your, uh, your insightful observations on this and stay well. And I hope we talk again soon. Thanks for giving me a chance to rant and rave, my friend. It is a great pleasure to do with you.
Thanks so much. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.